Very simple. I like to pick the chocolate that is in my box. When I did, you know, that was an advertising for my, for my idea of self-investing. Uh, a young student from Dartmouth, actually, who, who spent time at our place, told me, you know, this Forrest Gump movie, there's this scene, you know, life, is, life was like a box full of chocolates, you never know what's in it. I like to know, I like actually to know what's in it. And one of my cases is, if you pick the stocks yourself, you know what's in it. And in order to do that, I had to solve these problems, these problems of too much work, of loss subversion, and of um, work, right? No, work, information, and loss. Okay. The loss aversion, I'd like to cover that because that was the topic we had until now, can only be done by not looking at your portfolio. This is the only way. And today, I will never look at my portfolio because there's a 50% chance that the stock will have lost in a day. It's just statistics. There's only a 30% chance that your portfolio will have lost after a year. It's also statistics, but it's still 30%. So if you believe in what I've said now, and you're worried that you're going to feel bad about your losses, the only way, and that's actually in the New York Times, the only way is not look at it. There's no other tip I have, because loss is going to happen. And the other thing was, how do I make it less work? If, we, um, if I would like to ask you, what's the type of information you would need to have to make it less work? Um, what would you like to know from the stock? So if you invest in a stock, my question is, what is the information that you would like to have in order to make a decision? So you would like to know the channel development of the markets in order to buy or sell, like the cost of the stock, or what did you mean by cost? Past performance, analyst, out view, yeah. Kind of difficult. How do you select a stock? What do you need to know about it? I wanted to know the financial side of a stock. You know, is it more or less expensive? Is it safely financed? <coughs> How much did it grow? Which would allow me then to go to other aspects of the stock. Business model expected value, expected performance. You have high demands, you know. I, you know, I cannot give you that because this is really the things we don't know. Sustainability you can measure, that's possible. What I wanted to know was, I wanted to know the financial side of a stock before I make my decision. And this is really my area of expertise. I look at a company like this. There's a balance sheet, it has assets, it has debt, equity and profits, they pay a dividends and they pay a market price. One information that is really important is how high is that market price compared to the size of the company. And what I do is I relate the market price to the dividends, to the assets, to the equity and to profits, four things, which I turned with an algorithm, algorithmic to evaluating, that I explained briefly. The value rating basically tells you that this stock is expensive or cheap right now. You have to pay attention because you have to actually afterwards pick a stock. The second thing I wanted to know is how much growth did that stock have in the past? You know, stock returns, sales growth, profit growth. This was an information I found interesting as well. But then I also wanted to know, does this company have a lot of debt? <laughs> because in 2001, I was invested with a lot of high-tech stocks. <coughs> At that time, I had my own high-tech startup, so it's not at all diversified, and decided I need to diversify. I cannot have only high-tech stocks and myself work in a high-tech company. So I picked a really safe stock in the energy sector with the name of Enron and made my experience that that is actually quite important. So I also have a safety rating. How much debt would this company actually have? And I would have seen that Enron had a really bad debt rating because they have a lot more debt than anybody else. I turned that into a ranking. So when you have something really complicated like the price-sales ratio, which for, this, this, by the way, the Novartis about three years ago, or five years ago, was 
you know, I turn this number, which doesn't tell me anything, into a ranking for zero from zero from one to 100. 100 means really cheap, and five means actually quite expensive. You know, it's quite a bad price and sales ratio. I did that for all metrics that I discussed. And the result is, the result is um, um, uh, a rating for value, growth, and safety. And what I would like you to do now is to pick a stock and make a decision and afterwards explain in, in the audience why you made that decision. It's either a buy decision, it's a sell decision, or it's a hold decision. Hold means you don't know anything about that. But, you know, I, I prepared a couple of stocks. Here's really what we have to do. We, we pick a stock from the list. Um, you can search for it on Obermott to find more financial information, but you can also go to the website and find information about the stock, and I only give you 10 minutes. And then you make up your mind if you like that stock or not. And you make a buy, sell, or hold decision. And then you can promote your idea in class if you'd like. And the list of stocks I have here, these are all stocks I picked because they have a good value rating, a good growth rating, a good safety rating, and then a good combined rating. This is basically tells you that this stock is not that bad. It goes more into details, but you know this is actually a stock that you should look at. And what I want you to do is, uh, and I open the next, actually I open the next poll um, so that not everybody takes the same one. You pick a stock and then you look into that um, in more detail. So please on your app pick the stock that you like and I, I'll show that so when something is picked you don't pick it anymore. Just pick another one. Yeah? Where, where do, you, do we see the, the stocks on your website? Uh, you you uh, Google the name of the stock plus Obermatt, Ober, okay. Obermatt, my, the name of the company, and we will find it as the first result. So Umicore, Movi is taken, Almstom is taken. Aviva is taken. Any other one that you'd like to pick? You can also do it together, you don't have to do it alone. Vestas, Mezzo, Cummins, still available. Also, Hino Motors, Total. You can also come up with a sell decision and you can explain why. Okay, Fujifilm has too many. Somebody needs to pick something else from Fujifilm. Umicore as well, too many. Pick something else so that you know we get we get the breadth more. So if you have Fujifilm, try to take another one. Yeah, okay. So that looks better. Mezzo Fujifilm is covered by two, that's fine. Hino Motors and Total are not yet picked. We don't have to pick all of them. Should we start? Take ten minutes to look at the stock. Uh, either on Obermott with the ratings, but also on the website, and ideally use ESG information to make your decision as well. You know, see what they do, you know, how they promote their company, you know, and maybe an ESG-related story would help. Does anybody want to make a, a call for a stock they picked? Why you picked it? We like to start. Who, no, what did I, you pick? I picked Vestas uh, stock because they make wind energy. <laughs> okay. And it said that the growth uh, is not expected to be very high, but I, I think it was really high. Okay, you like so. You made the first ESG investment with your own set of criteria. <laughs> <laughs> Who else would like to has a stock to share an idea? You like shares? Okay. Okay. I, I chose a uh, movie on, uh, yeah, and I looked uh, at the website. It says that they're growing and they are the leader in the industry, which is a uh, food packaging, and they were sustainable too. So that was interesting. And then I looked at the stock exchange, the price <coughs> evolution, the price of the stock, and it was growing. So I think it can be good. Okay. Would invest or? I think so. Okay. 
Are there opinions in other stock? Yes? Uh, I have a movie as well, but I'm not awesome. That's because it seems like yeah, it's going to grow. Okay. Another stock? What did you pick? I did pick um, Fuji film. Fuji? Okay. Especially because I already know the name. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in the long term it looks like a growing market. But if I will only invest maybe for two years, I would sell at this point because it looks high. And expensive right now. Yeah, expensive. And also on Fobel Mod, it looks like the um, is it not? Umsatz sales, um, yeah. is, um, the sales are not that high anymore this year. Okay, then you have a lot of sales for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I chose Alstom mm -hmm. and I think the, the stock dropped years ago, so it's, it's not that high at the moment, like the others. And it's a growth market, so I will buy it. What is it? Now. Now uh, what, what is the market for doing? Yeah, like trains, metros, all the e-buses, <laughs> and the new passenger systems. Okay. Yeah. What do you have? Um, Metro. Metro? Yes, and I would invest in it. Okay. Because it's a stable investment. Okay. And also, also sustainable investment. What yeah. does Metro do? I forgot. I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, what will you do? Now we will choose. Okay. Will you choose one? Uh, Unicorn. Unicorn? Yeah. I, I didn't know them before, but they're in kind of recycling, but in the battery area, and they just closed the contract for some years with, um, with Samsung. Okay. A long term contract. But the rating at Uguna was for 2019 actually got quite worse in terms of security and I don't know the financing wasn't quite okay. secure. But I think the shares are at the moment quite cheap, so mm -hmm. you would invest in it. You would invest. Any other comments? Does anybody want to share something interesting they found? The reason why I did this is I made the experience that I created this stock algorithm because that's how I would invest. You know, I, I thought I don't want to give my money anymore someplace where I don't know where it will be. I was a little bit disappointed. I heard about for 15 years I was an ETF investor. And I said, actually, I would like to know better what, what my assets really are. And for this to do, I created this algorithm to analyze the stocks and then to put that online, and I did that about five years ago, and made a surprising um, discovery, which may happen to you too if you start your own company, that nobody cared about it. And uh, I was like, this is not possible. I've, I've run, you know, ratings over 10,000 stocks. You know, this is really valuable. I really believe in it. And what should I do? And at that point, um, uh, Fortnite and Minecraft was just being popular, and my son at that time was about 10 years old, um, watched other people play these games, which was something from completely new. You know, like how can you watch someone else play? I just couldn't believe it, but he was so into it that I decided, I just now use my own system, and I buy my own stocks, and I put that online as a video. Um, and uh, at that point, I was really terrified, because and I make a stock decision that will, there will certainly be a stock decision which is bad, and I will look like a fool. Uh, I was really terrified. I started my first couple of picks, and after two or three weeks, or five weeks, maybe it took two months or something, I suddenly, I suddenly realized it's more fun than I expected. I'm not a stock picker, really, but I wanted you to have the experience that these stocks out there are actually quite interesting. You know, if we spend really little time right now, by helping you with the financial side of the stock, you feel a little bit more comfortable looking at those stocks because you already have a rating. And I'm only, not the only one. I mean, banks have really good ratings on stocks as well, and some of the banks are open about these ratings and you can use them. And I realized uh, there are so many interesting stocks out there that I continue doing that. And in the meantime, I have 200 videos on how I picked stocks and about uh, 70 shares roughly that I bought. And of course, out of those 70 shares, I put actually my statement online so you can download it. And I do it only once a year because I don't want to look at my portfolio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even then it's really difficult, you know, I look at it and I make a PDF and I give it to my assistants immediately to, to upload it um, in order to not look at it. Uh, 
the, I have now about 70 stocks, and of course half of them have a loss. But only if, I'm, if the losses are a little bit less than the profits, I'm fine. I make a return. And I really like, I really like the fact that I know exactly where I'm invested. And that brings me to the last remark. Over those five years where I started to invest, and I attended a lot of conferences like that, where I listened to other people that are really smart about investing, and I also read books. I never came across an argument what should be dangerous about it. You know, it, was, it, was, it was never really convincing that picking a stock should be anything more dangerous than picking an ETF. With the only exception that an ETF from day one has more stocks in it than your own portfolio, on the first day your stock portfolio has just one stock, of course. But if you have the discipline and accumulate over time 30 to 50 stocks, you're probably more diversified than, than most of the indices that you find out there, with the big advantage that you really know what's in your portfolio. And when I summarize that into what you really need to know is that you have to move slow. You have to move in slowly because you're going to lose. You're actually going to lose money. If somebody comes to me and says, like, I want to start this, I tell them, buy the first stock and wait for half a year. Typically, they're really nervous after a month because they want to buy the second stock. They got so excited with the first one. I tell them, you have to wait. And if for half a year, you've incurred a loss, you've learned something. You've learned that you can cope with a loss. <laughs> yeah, it's really important. If you actually have made money, you have not learned anything and you have to wait until you finally make a loss someplace because the important thing is that you don't move out of your stocks when there are losses. It's really important. So the first rule is really this. <coughs> slowly in, slowly out. That's what safe investing is all about. This ran got to me on my uh, sabbatical in New Zealand. I've copied it ever since. And the second one, when you, just, when you actually have learned that you should move slowly and not fast, the second one is don't put all eggs in your, in your, in your basket. It's in German a little bit better, nicht alles auf, nicht alles auf eine Karte setzen. It makes it really clear. Don't put everything in, on one stock. Diversify. Now, if you start, you cannot be diversified. But then you have to keep in mind that you're going to save for 30 to 50 years. And you have to look at the amount that you will serve, save over 50 years. And then the loss that you make in the first year is not as bad. I think if you take those two rules, you cannot really do anything wrong. Um, there's also a technical term for it called dollar cost averaging, it's supposed to give you a better return, but actually it doesn't, that doesn't correspond with um, finance theory. Finance theory would say if you're an eternal being, you would invest everything in the market and you would not worry about the losses because you have an eternal lifespan, it doesn't matter. But we are all human beings and you know the losses really matter. And that's why I say, you know, if you have something get an inheritance, 500,000, start with 10,000 or maybe only 5,000. And I call this the learning money that you have to pay. And then you, you spend those 500,000 over maybe three years. That doesn't matter that you don't have a return on those 500,000. It's a lot more important than when the market crashed that you still have money to invest. And you feel good about all the money you have invested. And at the same time, when the markets go up, you already have participated a little bit. Every banker will tell you that this is a good approach, but nobody will tell you to take three to five years because it's their business model to get the money as quickly as possible. So I can say it because I don't take any money from anyone. Uh, I just provide research. When you don't put everything on one of the baskets, you basically have less losses. You know, I have a couple of situations where I lost everything. David Holmes in the UK, it's a retail chain, had a fraud case. It's zero. I also invested in my Borger high technology company. I lost about 80% of this stock. But if you have 70 stocks, you know, losing everything is only one seventieth. It's not that much money. So if you have, if you have this second rule, then actually stock investing becomes a lot less work. You've done it now in five minutes, and every of your decision was not a bad decision because thousands of investors do the same decision right now. How can you be wrong if professionals do the same thing right now? This is my encouragement. I would like to. I would like you to consider looking after your money yourself. Thank you.
the computer right now. So, so it's, <laughs> I guess it's quite a good present there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess if you have questions, you can still ask you at the time. Other questions? Yes. So when you decided you to sell your stocks, like? Yeah, I get this all the time. Um, <laughs> I invest my money because I want the return on it, and I sell my stocks when I want the money to buy something else. I mean, I've, I, have a, I have this you know, stock uh, subscription where you get stock tips every month, customized to you, and uh, a year or so ago, someone cancelled it. And I'm actually quite in contact with, my, with the people there, not that many to pay for it. And uh, you know, one said like, "Yeah, I have to cancel my subscription um, because you know the markets are going to crash. It's now a year ago. Right? We still have booming markets. You can never know when the markets crash. For me, when I started in 2015, I thought the markets are at their peak, and I still think to say, <laughs> you know, like, it's just you cannot, you cannot know better. It's impossible because the market would have crashed if it's not. So for me, it's really I, I have sold now stocks. I, going to publish that soon, when um, there was a spin out and the stock was only 2,000 francs in my portfolio and I said like, for 2,000 francs, I worry about that stock and I decided either I'm going to buy more, so I have five or 10,000 of that stock or I sell it all together. So that was the reason why I sold. But I never assume I know something better, so I never assume that uh, this stock is going to crash. Of course, sometimes this stock may... I may come across a quote from the CEO that I find really disgusting, you know, could happen, and then I sell it, because I don't want to have it anymore. But I don't assume that this will actually be the moment to sell, because I just don't know. If I would spend a lot of time, you know, trying to beat the market, and some investors do that, of course, then I would have that problem, but I don't like to spend time investing. It's, it's not my passion. Other questions? Yes. Everyone comes out with his own ESG ratings. When can we expect a standard in the market, like a standard of Poor's or Moody's? I don't think there's going to be a standard, honestly. Uh, I, I tried to show how complicated it is. I really, I think it's really more what you identify with. Um, there was a quote actually on that slide from Antoinette Tunziker. She was also tasking that she's now a sustainable fund manager for about 10 years. Before that, she was, I do this bad, I think, head of trading. Yeah. Really smart woman. And uh, I actually have this, all these three searches on her. <laughs> because uh, in panic, I sent her emails, like, you know, I'm doing it, I have to speak, you know, from where it was. <laughs> because much better at that. Let me, you know, give, give me research. And she gave me, you know, that research, and I look at that, look at that. And, and she actually made the point already a couple of years ago where she said, like, look, Herman, everybody's so different. You know, someone, I for instance, I like defense stocks. I think it's important that we defend our country. I don't have any problem with that defense weapon stock that we have in Switzerland, who grew up. You know, I don't have a problem. They could go public, I would invest. Because I believe even if some people get killed, you know, innocently, it's really, really important that we are strong as a country and defend our rights. So others, they think this is completely crazy and they would never invest in defense stocks. I think the solution is really more in a dialogue with the person so that their, their ethics or their morals are reflected in their portfolio. And how you can actually instrumentalize that in, in a product, I don't know. I think that's really difficult, but it could happen by being a lot more specific about what the fund is all about. So the fund is not about returns. What I would do if I were a fund manager, I would say we don't publish returns because they're misleading. I'll show you why. Maybe I would put a video online where people can watch why we don't show past returns. And I would say that it's not about the returns because we don't know what the returns will be in the future. It's about your uh, criteria being reflected in the philosophy of the fund manager and the fund. And I would spend a lot more time on that. With Credit Suisse, I just had the but they should know that they can save a lot of money by putting money into a, uh, into a pension plan, uh, what I, I see it wrong. And, you know, the big problem is, is really that I have no idea who stands behind those plans. You know, they make their investment decisions, I have no idea. They probably switch at one point. <coughs> if I had more identification with the person managing my money, I would feel a lot more comfortable about it. Other questions? We had uh, speculated over lunch, I think it was either Valentin or it was um, 
yeah. your idea basically where you said like I would like to see bankers publish their opinions you know what they do themselves it would really create a lot of trust and that's something that uh, if I were a bank which I probably will never be um, is something I would do I, would, I think that for a private bank it creates a lot of trust when you know what they are doing any other question should we stop? Mm -hmm.